A genius is defined as one who has exceptional intellect or creative power or another natural ability. This week on Full Frame, we'll introduce you to some of the world's 21st century geniuses, from one of the youngest to one of the oldest. One man is being called the next Albert Einstein, and one was a child prodigy. They each offer their own unique gift of high intellect. I'm Mike Walter, coming to you from the heart of New York City's Times Square. Let's take it full frame. Nima Arkani Hamed is a 21st century genius. He is considered one of the top minds at the forefront of theoretical physics. Known for being a disruptive force in science over the course of his career, his revolutionary theories about the functioning of the universe openly push boundaries. Recently, Arkani Hamed agreed to serve as the inaugural director of a controversial proposal to build the world's largest particle accelerator in China. The hope is that this powerful machine will find particles that Europe's Large Hadron Collider cannot, propelling science into a new era of physics research. Joining us to talk more about his research, the project, and understanding the universe is Nima Arkani Hamed. Welcome to Full Frame. Wonderful pleasure to be here. So both of your parents, uh, were in this field. Uh, what was dinner like as a kid? Was it pash the potatoes? <laughs> what do you think about quantum mechanics? Or well, uh, it was it was of course wonderful that my that my parents were both uh, scientists. Uh, I had a I had a very early interest in uh, in science, but actually it was it was natural history. It was uh, catching frogs and. Uh, salamanders and toads and, and snakes and uh, and uh, uh, freaking out my parents by uh, keeping them in my bedroom and studying their behavior and, and, and things like that. Um, I actually like to say that the becoming a physicist was my act of teenage rebellion uh, <laughs> because my parents didn't want me to, to be a, to be uh, to follow in, the, in their footsteps. But but uh, why is that? Uh, well, I mean, I think just uh, they're 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 interested in in um, in a variety um, and. Um, uh, but I think uh, uh, I realized uh, pretty young that, um, I, of course, I, was, I loved the natural world, um, like almost all kids do. Uh, and um, I came to pretty early on to also love mathematics. And uh, when I realized that there was, there was, there was a, such a thing you could do with your life that, uh, that used mathematics to understand simple things about the world around you, um, that was absolutely thrilling. And, uh, and at around you know, 13, 14 years old, I decided to be a theoretical physicist. It's interesting. I, I read somewhere that you said uh, your mission was to understand the universe. And, <laughs> and, uh, which sounds... I'm not sure I said that. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to say you said sure, it. Uh, sure. <laughs> you can disagree with me. But, but, but while that sounds simple, it's, it's really quite difficult, isn't it? I mean, one could spend their entire life working on that, couldn't well, they? Well, I, I think um, uh, there are many different aspects to understanding uh, the universe. Science is, uh, is a humongous, enormous field with all sorts of different things going on. Uh, the, the, the particular part of science that uh, my, my, my colleagues and I focus on, uh, fundamental physics, um, is in many ways uh, the oldest and most mature part of science. In a sense, the questions that we are talking about, people first started posing in a, in a somewhat ill-posed way, but still first started vaguely talking 2,000 years ago. And then in a more, in a more modern form, people like uh, Kepler and Galileo Newton uh, uh, really had this basic realization that, that physical laws are governed uh, by, uh, by, by by simple and deep ideas that are best formulated in the language of mathematics. And that set us down a tra trajectory that we've been really following for uh, four centuries since. And what we're doing now isn't really qualitatively different than what they were doing uh, 400 years ago. We're just much further along this, uh, this uh, process. Um, so this is a, it's a very small part of science, uh, but it's, of course, uh, for those of us doing it, we think it's a very singular and very important part of science to try to understand uh, uh, this basic mathematical character of the laws of nature at the simplest and deepest possible level. And that's the big surprise. That's, uh, so when you ask what is it you do when you wake up in the morning and you're trying to understand the laws of nature or understand the universe, um, uh, 
the fascinating thing is that uh, we, we, we've understood over this 400-year process that this seeming uh, dizzying variety and array of different phenomena that we see in the universe around us uh, turn out to be, as we study things more and more deeply, uh, differing aspects of, of, of something that's more unified and uh, described by uh, often more alien and, and stranger, but simple and deep uh, mathematical equations. And uh, because of this fact, because of the fact that things seem to be getting simpler uh, and deeper as, 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 as time goes on, um, we have something concrete to do when we wake up in the morning because we can try to latch on to one aspect of the problems uh, and the mysteries that are confronting us and try to see if we can make some, some, some progress on them by monkeying with the rules a little bit. And we're tremendously constrained by the 400 years of success that we've had so far because almost every idea you have for how to change things to deal with some of the current paradox or mysteries is going to be wrong. It's going to be wrong because we understand so much about the way the world works already that if you monkey around with things a little bit, you're almost immediately going to be ruled out by things, just things that we've known for a long time already. Well, that's the interesting thing is, uh, you know, when I do a show, I'm searching for answers, but, but much of your life is searching for questions and the right questions, isn't that's it? That's absolutely I mean, true. I mean, it's, it's the... Um, uh, it's the most interesting aspect of the of the transition between being an enthusiastic youngster in uh, in uh, in this in this part of science and and, and becoming a professional researcher. Um, you you spend a lot of your a uh, lot of your life when you're in high school when you're an undergraduate learning how to solve problems that are well posed. You solve problems on exams. You solve problems on problem sets. You sharpen the skill for for once a problem becomes well defined, being able to go and solve it. And then, then you realize that 99.99% of life uh, when you're trying to do research is to figure out what the correct questions are to ask. And, uh, and everything is uh, much more chaotic than the sort of cookie cutter picture of the way uh, science works that uh, we unfortunately sometimes uh, uh, teach or, or, or tell people. Um, the cart comes before the horse all the time. Sometimes you're in the possession of the right answer uh, to some set of questions before you quite know what the question is. And then, uh, and because you have the right answer, you sort of back figure out what the question was that this right answer is answering. Very often, especially in, in this part of theoretical physics, you're in possession of the correct equations before you know exactly what they mean. And, um, uh, and, is that maddening? Uh, um, well, it's not maddening. It's, it's, uh, it, uh, this, is, uh, this is part of the, of, of the gift from nature, if you like, that, that it seems to be described by mathematical laws, is that while human language um, uh, and, and, and our grammar and th these things hardwired into our brains uh, aren't perfectly suited to uh, describing the world and it leads us to paradoxes and confusions. Uh, uh, the, the equations have this uh, perfection to them and they know much more about what's going on um, in the world than we do. I want you to go back over something you said before we, we, we started the, the broadcast, which was this ocean of ignorance, this analogy that you talked about. Uh, describe it for us. Well, this, this is not my, uh, my, my analogy, as, as, as I was describing to you earlier. My, one of my favorite uh, Nobel laureates in physics in our, in our field is uh, uh, won the Nobel Prize back in 2004. Uh, David Gross um, uh, likes to use this, uh, this uh, analogy that, uh, that we, we now know a fair amount about the way the world works. Um, but one of, the, one of the things this analogy is supposed to explain is what may seem like a mysterious fact, that the more we learn about the world, uh, uh, the more it seems, uh, the more questions we get to ask. It's not that we get to ask fewer questions, but that we come closer to a feeling of finality. Uh, in fact, as, as time goes on, we learn more and we get to ask once. And, this, and there, there's a nice picture for this, which is to imagine that there is some part, uh, there's this vast ocean of ignorance out there, the, the dark uh, things that we don't understand. Um, and there's a little space in this big world that we have carved out, a uh, space of things we do understand. It's like the inside of a, of a sphere or a ball. Um, and uh, of course, deep in the center of this ball are the things that we've understood for hundreds and hundreds of years, and they're in textbooks, and we teach the kids in uh, junior high school. Um, uh, but uh, as we get uh, closer uh, to the cutting edge of, uh, of, of science, uh, as researchers, we're close to the, to the edge of this ball, and our purpose in life is to try to push the edge a little further out, a little further out into the, uh, uh, take out, take some of the, uh, uh, this uh, ocean of ignorance out and replace it with things that we understand. So this ball is getting bigger as time goes on, if we're successful, right? 
But you see, there's something interesting. As, 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 the, as the ball gets bigger, of course, the sort of volume of the ball is getting bigger. We know more things. But the surface area of the ball is also getting bigger, which means that there is more and more uh, new kinds of questions that we get to ask that we didn't even um, know we could ask before. And um, so that's, that's, a, that's, that's a nice uh, analogy. It is a deep fact. It is a deep fact that um, uh, the more we understand about the way the world works, uh, the more questions we get to ask. And uh, what makes it deep is that some of the questions we get to ask, we didn't even know were questions before we had the new understanding. Let me get back to the, the sphere, this sphere, this circle that you described, yeah. and this ocean of ignorance. It's going to grow because of what you're going to be doing in China. There's no doubt about it. So Absolutely, talk to yeah. me about uh, that. How did it come about, and what's the hope there for you? Uh, well, you know, physics is an experimental science. It's a science. So, so uh, uh, we have a lot of mysteries. We have a lot of puzzles, but we need to, uh, we need to make measurements and, and observations uh, in order to give us clues about what the right answers are to, to, to some of the big questions facing us. And, um, and this part of physics, fundamental physics, uh, the experiments that are involved are at the extremes of, uh, of our sort of frontiers of what we see in the world. Uh, we have to do observations and measurements on the largest possible scales, look at the, the structure of the universe and cosmology ultimately on the very largest possible scales. That's one class of experiments. And another class of experiments um, uh, is to probe the shortest possible distances, to probe what the laws of nature are like and what the tiniest possible scales. Now, uh, there's, there's, there's an extra layer of importance associated uh, with this idea of probing things at the tiniest possible scales, because we've learned over the, the last hundred years that it's when we study nature at the shortest possible distances that the fundamental simplicity, unity, and the sort of deepest aspects of the physical laws are, are revealed there. Uh, the experiments that are being done at the Large Hadron Collider today are probing distances that are around 100 times smaller than the nucleus of the atom. <laughs> And the nucleus of the atom is itself a million times smaller than than than. Uh, so we're we're really looking at things at incredibly tiny distances. That's why this machine is 27 kilometers around in, in Geneva. It, it smashes uh, particles into each other. Uh, two sets of particles going around this 27 kilometer ring. One going around this way. One going around the other way. They're going at 0.9999999 times the speed of light. And we do all of that in order to uh, when when they smash into each other, reveal something about what's going on at this distance around 100 times smaller than the nucleus of the atom. Now, it turns out that uh, the Large Hadron Collider made an incredible discovery uh, back on July 4th, 2012. It discovered uh, the famous Higgs particle. Um, and, uh, and this is a classic example of a discovery that opens up many, many more questions than it resolves. Because while from one point of view, uh, uh, theoretical physicists had expected the Higgs particle to exist for something like 50 years. From a more sophisticated, more advanced point of view, it's utterly mystifying that it exists and it has the properties that it has. In fact, uh, uh, it's, it, it's sort of insane that something like the Higgs exists. Um, and uh, and, and it, uh, it calls into question some very fundamental things that we believe about uh, the two foundational principles of early 20th century physics, the principles of relativity that Einstein gave us and the laws of quantum mechanics. These principles are shockingly successful. We see nothing wrong with them. They work over every kind of experiment we've done, every, uh, every um, uh, question that we've asked, every way that we've hit these principles, they've survived. And yet these very principles would seem to make something like the Higgs particle impossible. And yet there it is, it exists. Um, so what we need to do is, uh, so uh, the Large Hadron Collider was 30 years in the planning. Uh, you know, it, it, it ran for quite a while until it finally discovered the Higgs. Um, but uh, it just brought us to the point of uh, maximal confusion from the theoretical point of view. There's something deeply wrong, not a little bit wrong, not, uh, uh, not, so not approximately wrong. There's something deeply wrong about our understanding of nature, which is associated with the Higgs particle, so we need to study it better. So where does the collider in, in China yeah, fit so, in? Yeah, so um, uh, the purpose of the collider in China is to study the Higgs and to study it, uh, to put it under much more powerful microscope than we've managed uh, uh, to do or we, we, we will ever do with the uh, Large Hadron Collider. Uh, you need to build a machine that's going to produce millions of millions of Higgs particles and, and, and study them. Uh, uh, study them in, in, in detail, uh, look at them, 
uh, look at how the Higgs interacts with, uh, with uh, other particles. Ultimately, look to see how the Higgs particle interacts with itself. And only by looking at these, uh, only look by looking at these properties can we uh, settle some of these uh, profound questions about, um, uh, about ultimately, uh, deeper aspects of, uh, of quantum mechanics and, 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 and space-time. And um, uh, what, happened a couple of, uh, what happened a couple of years ago, you see, these large accelerator projects take roughly three decades from when they're first the twinkle in someone's eye uh, to when they're fully operational and they give you all the results that you're interested in. It took roughly 25 years with the, uh, with the, with the LHC itself. So... Uh, right after the Higgs discovery in 2012, it was, it was obvious to all of us in the field, certainly obvious to me, it's obvious to many people, that this was the ideal time to start. We knew what the next step was. We had to study this damn thing in tremendous, uh, we had to put it under this uh, 10, 20, 30 times higher uh, resolution. Uh, but because these things take so long to plan, the, the, the time to start thinking about doing something about it was, was now. Um, and uh, I heard from a number of my friends that there was a proposal in China for, uh, for uh, doing this. And, uh, and I went uh, to a Beijing and I talked to um, uh, uh, Yifang Wang, who is the uh, head of the Institute for High Energy Physics in uh, Beijing. And it became very clear to me that they were extremely serious and, uh, and, and they had vision, they had ambition, um, and they, they wanted to try to pull something like this off. Now, this is not an incremental step for China. It's a, it's a, it's a humongous leap compared to anything that they've done before. It's really ambitious. It's really big. And um, uh, that, that's, of course, what makes it so exciting. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's really big as a scientific project. It's really, it would be really big anywhere as a scientific project. It's, uh, it's an especially ambitious undertaking because right now the largest accelerator that China has is a 250-meter uh, uh, around accelerator in Beijing, where the thing that we're talking about might be as large as 100 kilometers around. Okay, so it's a humongous leap. Um, uh, but, uh, but we know how to do it. The technology for how to build this machine exists. Um, and it's and a win-win, as you say. You know, it's the importance of that, that connection between uh, people like yourself going over there and, and kind of the sharing of uh, it, it's, it's, it's cross-pollination in a sense. I mean, it, it's, it's a larger step in many respects. The reason it? I'm personally so excited about, uh, about this machine, specifically in China, and uh, my, my friends in Europe are thinking about, uh, many of my friends in Europe are, are, are thinking about, uh, 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 about building the next generation machine like this there. I mean, right, the, uh, a machine uh, larger than, than the LHC at around the same site where, 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 the, uh, where the Large Hadron Collider is now. But I think there is something extra special and great about doing this in, uh, in, uh, in, in China. And there's, there's one aspect of it that's purely, totally uh, idealistic. Um, uh, it's hard to imagine uh, taking this next big step. And, you know, this, this experiment is going to take uh, roughly 10,000 people working on it uh, in, order to, uh, in order to get all the results out of it we want. Right now, at the Large Hadron Collider, we have two teams of 3,000 people each working on two experiments. Uh, this is going to be even bigger, and, uh, and, and it's going to take uh, more cooperation, more thought, more dedication. That's the, it's, a, it's around 10,000 people that we're talking about. It's going to be a large international community of people uh, working on, on this uh, on this uh, uh, sort of thing. It's hard to imagine that uh, we're going to be able to pull it off without engaging, really actively engaging, uh, a billion of the world's most talented and interesting uh, people uh, into fundamental physics. So, uh, so that's one aspect where I think it's, it would just be incredible to, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to get China involved just so we can have access purely selfishly, as far as physics is concerned, to that ocean of, uh, of uh, talent. Um, but I think as far as China is concerned, there's uh, obvious positives as well. First of all, there's fascinating, uh, as you're referring to, there's going to be, a, I think, a, a fascinating uh, uh, merge of uh, East and West being uh, brought together for a, for a common purpose. Um, and uh, just, uh, just as a uh, uh, just the the cultural aspects of that are extremely interesting. It'll be uh, um, it'll be an, uh, a very important way of of, of, fo of, of of fostering at a very high level uh, um, deep friendships between uh, between uh, deep important friendships between uh, East and West. That's one aspect. Uh, another aspect uh, 
uh, uh, purely selfishly from the uh, Chinese point of view, is that uh, while these machines, these projects are indeed, they're, they're, they're expensive, they cost billions of dollars, um, it's a sort of investment you can make where, unlike any other field of science, it's not possible to do this in any other field of science, but you, if you make this large investment in this field of science, you're guaranteed to be the leader of the world in that field by the time, by the time you're done. And that's because we're not going to have 12 of these machines uh, lying around all over the world, and the physics community will go where the machine is. And, uh, and I think that's um, uh, the, the, the cultural challenge uh, associated with that, uh, how it will work, international cooperation, all these things are, are yet to be worked out. And it's going to be very interesting to see how they are worked out. But I think... Let uh, me ask one final question. I think you hit on this earlier before we had a chance to just kind of visit. You were talking about bold leadership of, of countries. And, and back in the 60s, uh, John F. Kennedy saying, we're going to put a man on the moon. The importance of that, obviously, it's important to put a man on the moon. But the importance of that commitment to the science community, uh, China's government is doing that with this. Talk to me about it. And, and it's cost an enormous amount of money. But the payoff, while it may not be apparent today, over the long term is huge, right? Yeah, I, I think. Um uh, we live in, in a world with increasingly difficult challenges. Um, uh, and a lot of these challenges uh, face us, and we have to deal with them on, not on the time scale of six months or a year, but we have to think ahead. We have to plan for a year, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. Um, the world is, incre is in increasingly technical. Uh, uh, we, need to, we need to have a large group of talented people who know what it's like uh, to be technically trained and to think about problems that are going to not be solved in two weeks or three months based on some small incremental iteration of what the guy previously did, but which might take radically new ideas, but which might also take five or 10 or 20 years to germinate. The importance of fundamental physics is we are that field that have been doing exactly that for four centuries now. Uh, uh, it's a small group of people. We don't, we're not a huge part of the, you know, we don't, even with these very big expensive machines, you know, we're talking about one part in 10,000 or one part in 100,000 of GDP, depending on how you, uh, uh, on, on, on how you count. Um, we're, uh, we're, 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 we're small perturbation on, 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 on the economy, but it's something that we do. We train people um, just by osmosis. You don't learn this in books. You have to be around people who know how to do it. Uh, what it's like to tackle questions which seem impossible at first. You don't even know remotely how you're going to start uh, thinking about them. And yet we've been doing this for 400 years. You gradually start chipping away uh, the power of the scientific method to weed out wrong ideas and slightly push forward ideas that have something correct about them, even if they're not the, the right answer, until you gradually converge on, on the right way of thinking about things. Um, this is, uh, this is uh, just as a, as a practical thing. Um, uh, we are that part of science, I think, which we've been doing this the longest and who have this long-term vision um, and, and infuse us in the way people think about things. And it's finally related, I think the ultimate benefit to, uh, the deepest benefit to society as, as a whole is to live in a, it's a live, to be part of a people, to be part of a country. Um, where you do things like this, and it's not just uh, not just fundamental physics. We 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 want to go to space. We want to do all kinds of uh, other things, which push us to the very limits, that are as singular as possible, are um, uh, but have a purity of purpose, a certain nobility to them. And it's important to feel that you live in a country which does really big things. And I think uh, this this machine would would uh, be one element of uh, of making something like that happen in uh, China. Nima, thank you so much for stopping by. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Coming up next, we speak with one of the world's oldest and most inventive inventors. Yashiro Nakamatsu is one of the world's most famous inventors. He likes to be called by his nickname, Sir Dr. Nakamatsu. But admirers call him Japan, but he's even got Thomas Edison beat, running circles around him with at least 3,000 patents. In case you're wondering, Edison, who invented the light bulb and the phonograph, lags far behind with the second most patents in the world.
The 87-year-old human dynamo has also written dozens of books, and he's repeatedly run for political office in Japan. Perhaps his best-known invention is the floppy disk. While many of his creations are serious, he's also come up with some amusing gadgets, like a musical golf putter. I recently spoke with Dr. Nakamatsu, who joined me from Tokyo in our Washington, D.C. studios. Let me start by talking to you about uh, Edison. You know, you're compared to him so often. Uh, you're this renowned inventor. What do you think the differences are between you and Edison? I think Edison has no, no, edi no education. And I think the real, real invention should be three elements. First, theory. Second, Pika. Third, practicality. These three elements is important. And unfortunately, in case of Edison, the first theory is he is made by experiment, not by knowledge, because he is not educated. This is a difference. But what's interesting is your first invention came at such an early age, didn't it? I mean, you were, you were just a little kid when you made your first invention, correct? Yes, age of five. That is automatic airplane adjusting center of lift and center of gravity automatically. Uh, unbelievable. Um, now, uh, talk to me about, uh, you know, your, your nurturing that you had as a child growing up. Uh, do you think it was that, that environment, uh, were your parents uh, nurturing and, that, and they, they brought out that instinct in you? I think DNA is very important. My mother was very creative and grandfather, that is my mother's father, also very creative. He was a doctor, medical doctor, and uh, he opened a hospital in America and Japan and he made many inventions, including Kara film. I want to get into some of your inventions in just a minute, but I, but I want to get uh, an inventor's worldview. I mean, does an inventor look at the world differently than the, the rest of us in, in that perhaps they look at it and say, well, this is the way it looks now, but let me think about how it could be much better, and, and that's why they come up with inventions. I mean, how do you think differently than a, than a regular person, do you think? I think, uh, as I said before, three elements. First, theory, second, flash, and third, practicality. These three elements is very difficult to make by uh, normal people. Which invention brought you the most joy? My answer is, do you have children? <laughs> yes, I do. I see where you're going with this. <laughs> that is the answer, isn't it? That's right. <laughs> okay, well, then I won't make you choose, but uh, I think the one that most of us think about is the floppy disk. When you came up with the floppy disk, uh, did you think that it would just revolutionize things? I mean, can you see how it's going to change the world? It was invented in 1947, and uh, it was completed uh, 1952, when I was uh, uh, university, the University of Tokyo. Then, after 25 years from my invention, IBM started production and marketing. So I licensed to them. So, you know, invention takes time, such as 25 years in case of floppy disk. So, 25 years later, it's in production. Uh, what was the feeling like when you started to see it popping up everywhere? I mean, it, it became such a, a, a part of the world. Yes, I think by, the, by my invention, computer revolution and the IT industry started. So I think, really, invention is change the world. But not for money. My spirit of invention is love. Can you talk to me a little bit about your creative process? Because I think it's fascinating. I've, I've seen video of you uh, where you're, you're swimming underwater. You've got a notepad and a pen. Uh, it's, 
it's a little bit different than how most of us uh, work and how we kind of tinker with our ideas. Talk to us about how you, how you came up with the idea, first of all, and what it is that you do. Well, if we have oxygen, we can make only normal idea. Therefore, I shall dive under the water. There is no oxygen. Then my brain need oxygen. Then my brain must work very hard. That is my theory to create excellent inventions under the water. There are some other things that are interesting about uh, your practices, uh, and I've, uh, <laughs> I've, I've seen some video about this as well. Uh, eating one meal a day, taking pictures of the meal, uh, you, you don't sleep as much as the rest of us. Walk us through some of these different things that, are, uh, that, that you've kind of adopted over time and, and why you've done that. Because two, uh, excuse me, three meals per day is too much. And I think, according to my experience, only one meal per day means we'll, be, we'll bring best condition of brain. And not only taking one meal, but also you must select quality of meal. Therefore, I took all my pictures every day, still continuing. Present time, 44 years continuing, taking all my meals, and then analyze, and then take my blood, compare blood conditions and meal. If there's a five-year-old uh, watching this out there and they're saying, I, I want to follow in his footsteps, I want to create something right now and, and continue to do so throughout the rest of my life, any advice you'd give them? I think uh, mother is very important. In my case, mother, very, my mother was very intellectual mother and she taught me at my age of three, physics, chemistry, mathematics, many things from age of three. This is a reason I could invent at age of five. So mother's power is very important. We spent a lot of time talking about your brain, your mind, you've created so many things. One thing we haven't spent a lot of time talking about, but I do want to ask you a question about it, and that's your nose. Um, you, you love cameras, and you don't pick them with just your eyes. Your nose is also involved in the process. Explain for our viewers how you go about uh, selecting cameras. Yes. Usually, in order to select camera, usually it looks lens or um, body mechanism, or these things. But in my case, of course I shall do check. But in addition to this, my method is smell camera. This is a very good test, because smell express all quality of camera process. Please try. <laughs> what should I be looking for when I'm smelling the camera? <laughs> now I'm smelling. <laughs> what do you, is that a good one? Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> What's it smell like? Very good smell. This is the latest camera. <laughs> well, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for visiting with us. Certainly appreciate it. Okay. All right. Very good. So long. Coming up next, meet a young student who is ahead of her class, way ahead. Most young girls her age were attending sleepovers and playing video games, but not Thessalonica Arzu Embry. Instead of being a typical kid, she was busy graduating high school at the age of 
get this, 11. By 14, she completed a Bachelor of Arts degree in psychology. Homeschooled by her mother from a young age, her high IQ is only one part of her laundry list of talents. She's also determined, ambitious, and curious. Last year, at the age of 16, Arzu Embry received her master's degree, and now at 17, she is working on her doctoral degree in aviation psychology. Along the way, she also managed to author five books covering topics from expediting the completion of college, securing justice to financial investing. She also created a program called JUMP that helps students complete college as quickly as possible so they can enter society and do the most good. In the midst of her busy academic life, Arzu Embry has made time to join us to talk about her unique journey and how she's accomplished so much in so very little time. Um, thank you for coming in and making me feel so insignificant. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> which I guess everybody kind of has that feeling when you start measuring you. Even Albert Einstein, I was just reading this, your IQ is 199. Einstein's was determined to be about 30 points, you're 30 points higher than Einstein. Um, how did you feel when somebody told you that? What was that like? Uh, well, I was uh, really, well, first I want to say thanks for inviting me here. I'm really glad to be on the show, and I look forward to encouraging the audience. Um, I was very excited about the, uh, the IQ being 199, but um, I feel glad because I um, it placed in a position to help society in, uh, in deep ways, in as many ways as possible. So let me ask you about learning. Um, was, it, was it evident early on that uh, the, that brain was racing at a much higher level than the rest of us? <laughs> well, uh, yes, because um, I think it's a matter of applying uh, what a person has learned to the general society. So, for example, when I was four years old and I went to the doctor's office, I remember checking out their license online and um, making sure the medicines they prescribed was the correct medicines to take for whatever issue I went in there for. You know, I was reading, uh, it was interesting, I, I started reading, you, you've sparked a lot of interest to me. I started reading about child geniuses, um, which clearly you fall into that category. And, and one person put it this way. They say most of us have a beginning, middle, and end, not child genius, geniuses. It's almost zero to 60. Um, and I would think in some respects it's fantastic, but in some respects maybe it's tough uh, for a young kid. Can you talk to me about uh, that duality? Were there difficulties uh, given the fact that a lot of other kids probably weren't at your level. <laughs> well, uh, I think it gives an edge because I'm able to communicate with people of different ages and uh, not just people of the same age. And uh, being able to communicate on different levels has been very helpful because it, um, it's, I'm able to relate to people and uh, get things done like business. The genius race, there's, there's a question in here, and I want you to talk to me a little bit about it is question 15. Are you a genius for a limited time period? Um, <laughs> is that something you've struggled with or thought about? Because obviously I, I think of you as being a genius forever, but is that something a genius thinks about? Well, a lot of people ask that because when they get a certain age, they feel like um, as they get in their middle age that their cognition level changes and they may not react to certain things like fast enough. So, for example, when you're sitting at a stoplight and uh, the car, the light changes from red to green, it takes the, like uh, a few seconds longer to react that the light changes to green before they drive off. And so some people feel like it's their um, like, like reaction time waning and then they consider themselves less of a, uh, uh, intelligent or less intelligent as they get older. And so, um, in my opinion, I don't think that people have to be subject to the fact that their intelligence determines that they're a genius. You, you've done so much, and you've written all of these books. Um, do you know how to goof off? <laughs> yes. You do? Because yes. I'm not sure. Do you have time for it? Yes, uh, comedy is my favorite uh, genre of <laughs> movies. <laughs> so you do find time for it. What about the pressure, uh, having excelled and been so successful at such a young age, do you feel like, uh, you know, how do I... How do I top this? I mean, does that ever enter your mind, or is that even a concern of yours? <laughs> no, that's not a concern because uh, achievements is not necessarily the biggest priority. The priority is to uh, help society and uh, create businesses that would uh, create more um, like inventions and things that would strengthen the big, the bigger part of society. So that's my main goal. So I'm not 
just thinking, I, I, I want to top it. I'm just thinking of more ways I can help society. But you're so young. Uh, yes. Look into your crystal ball. I mean, what, what do you <laughs> hope to su be successful at at age 35 or 45? Because I think the other thing that, that must happen is, you know, you have all this curiosity and this knowledge, but you're c continuing to try and expand on that. I mean, do you see yourself as doing maybe this until I'm 30 and then I'm going to start doing this from 30 to 40? I mean, how do you view the horizon? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm still uh, have, working on my life plan, and I see that uh, my, my uh, bigger uh, goal right now is to start working, developing a company that will be uh, as large as Blackstone an Investment Company and directly compete with it and become a Fortune 50 company. <laughs> <laughs> Don't dream small, dream big. Right. Thank you so much for Thank coming you. on the broadcast. It's been a great fun. We'll be right back with the woman named in the Guinness Book of World Records as the person with the highest IQ in the world, and she achieved that by the age of 10. Marilyn Voss Savant is a national columnist, author, company executive, and by the way, a genius. Tested at 10 years old, her record IQ score of 228 was shrouded in secrecy. But in 1986, word got out, so she landed at the top of the Guinness Book of World Records smartest people in the world list for both child and adult IQ scores. Since then, her super genius status has kept her in the news and given her international fame. While her IQ is more than double that of a normal person, she's much more than a score. Savant has been writing a question and answer column called Ask Maryland for Parade Magazine for 30 years. The syndicated Sunday magazine is read by roughly 80 million people in the U.S. When she's not entertaining questions, she's also a wife, a mother, a grandmother, and an avid ballroom dancer. Joining us now to talk about her extraordinary life is Marilyn, and thank you so much for coming in. Hey, thank you. So I mentioned shrouded in secrecy. Do you think it was right that your parents didn't tell you right off the bat, hey, you're, you're off the charts with this number? Oh, actually, that wasn't shrouded in secrecy. You mean from the world, not from me. Back when I was a kid, I was tested back when I was uh, 8, 9, 10, 11, and on into adulthood. I've taken a lot of tests throughout my life. But back then, when I was uh, 10 years old, that, that was the score that you mentioned. There have been scores since then. Um, it wasn't any, anything new to me. My parents knew, my friends knew, my teachers knew, I knew. I just thought, uh, I thought there were a few more people like me in the world. You know, I knew what it was like. Uh, but it turns out that there weren't. That was the, the only odd thing, I suppose, that people didn't tell me at the time that it was really a rare score. I thought that there were quite a few people like that, and actually. I still do. But you know, <laughs> at the time, it wouldn't have mattered much if I had paid to that because at that time, it wasn't thought that women were suited to do anything in particular with their intelligence. So I wasn't encouraged in any way whatsoever. You know, one, I, I saw an interview with you where you said uh, you had permissive upbringing. Your parents were in a sense, uh, you'd go to them with a question, well, you go find it out. Uh, they kind of sparked uh, that uh, interest in you to, to seek out knowledge and curiosity. Uh, uh, can you talk to me about the difficulty of parenting a, a super genius and how did they respond to it, do you think? Well, I don't really think they paid a lot of attention to that. You have to understand my background. My grandparents were coal miners. One of my uh, grandfather's was killed in the mines. Another grandfather was injured so badly in the mines he could only walk with a cane afterward. My parents were immigrants from Germany and Italy, and they weren't thinking about focusing on the kids at all. The whole idea was to just be independent, earn a living, and no one really paid much attention to me, actually. As I said, mostly because I was a girl, and I accepted that. Did you feel different at all, though? You know, I think we all feel a little bit different at times. Uh, but I, I, I felt different in the sense that we all have this unique, these unique qualities. I felt that I had mine. And everyone, people liked that. They respected me for that. They maybe respect people for their particular skills and abilities. Uh, one thing that I noticed in particular, though, that at the time, and then later throughout life especially, people that we think are very smart are not necessarily very smart. 
they are more likely to be educated in their particular field or very experienced in their careers. And we confuse that with smartness. So when we call upon experts, we hear them say whatever it is they have to say. But that doesn't mean they have any analytical ability. That doesn't mean they have the ability to process the information at hand. That's really more of what intelligence is. I've even heard you say uh, that perhaps you shouldn't pair the two words best and brightest because they aren't necessarily the same thing. Hmm. Well, I suppose that's true, too. You know, when you think of um, scientists, for example, people tend to think that scientists are the smartest people in the world, and the smartest people in the world are scientists. I disagree with that completely. When I look back at my own life, uh, when I was a kid, I'd mentioned to you that no one gave me any encouragement, which is uh, this, this is not a complaint, this is a fact of life. Uh, it's not a big deal, it didn't bother me then, it, I don't really think it bothers me now. Uh, but at the time, as I said, uh, women weren't thought to be suited to do anything in particular with their, their intelligence, with the one possible exception would be, if you were smart, you'd go into the scientific field naturally. And no one said that to me, but looking back, that was really the, the only option, if I had options. and. Uh, I, back then, <clears throat> I couldn't imagine looking through the world, looking at the world through a microscope or even or a telescope. That was anathema to me. I just don't feel that I could that I could have focused that tightly on something all of the time. Fine for school, fine for for certain limited tasks, but not as not as a worldview. I wanted something much broader than that. If I had, you know, looking back, if I had it all to do over again, or if I could just have somehow had some, um, so, some maturity when I was, you know, 13 or 17 or whatever, I'd become a politician. Now, Politicians are not synonymous with smarts, I know. <laughs> well, I was going to say, we're seeing a couple of <laughs> right. candidates out there that I'm not sure at your IQ level. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, but wouldn't you rather see a really smart person in front of a microphone instead of, as I said, looking at the world through a microscope or a telescope? That's genius. Uh, <laughs> let me ask you about uh, finding your way as a genius, because uh, I count uh, amongst my friends, most of them, uh, I've had the conversation where they're like, oh my God, my boss is an idiot. So, um, <laughs> and we're just regular people. So that I could be. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm be. not sure I'd argue with them. But I'm just wondering, as a genius, how difficult it must be to go to work each day and just not have, you know, mental gymnasts making the decisions and you're kind of the worker oh, bee under them. Oh, I see what them. you mean. Well, the world isn't, isn't like that. We don't necessarily have uh, smart people running the show because they may not be social people. They may not be organized people. They're all different kinds of skills. We all have this, have this uh, mix, of, uh, mix of skills. I notice in particular that uh, sometimes I feel pretty alone and sometimes I could, you know, that can especially happen when I'm alone, you know, in a, or excuse me, that can happen when I'm in a room full of people. That's one of the times that I actually feel alone. But as far as uh, being... Why is that, do you think? Well, there's this feeling that if, if I need answers, if I want to turn to someone, I really don't have anyone to turn to. I do the best I can. I have to accept that. Maybe, maybe it's the fact that we, that we all need to do that. So having a high IQ, is it a burden or a gift or both? Oh, it's an absolute blessing. It's never a burden. I take it back. If you're on an airline seat next to someone who knows your name, then, then it's a burden. Believe me, it's, it's a real burden. You have to pretend to, you know, go to sleep. But other than that, it is a blessing. It is a blessing privately, personally, professionally, in every way. Let me ask you about uh, your marriage, because I think it's, it's this unique marriage where it's 
the heart and the head. I mean, you're, <laughs> and, and, and you know why I'm saying that. I mean, your your husband uh, clearly has made his mark in the world too with the the, the Jarvik uh, device, which is obviously keeping people alive. Um, so clearly, a very a bright man. Um, did he feel intimidated uh, dating you? I mean, what was the relationship like? And, and what was it like finding somebody who you felt comfortable with uh, on an intellectual basis? Ah, uh, well, he is intimidated by nothing, by no one. I can't possibly intimidate him. I would enjoy doing that. I think it would teach him a lesson now and then, but, <laughs> but no, uh, he can't be intimidated. Uh, that's something that we have enjoyed very much, t uh, very much together, the, the intellectual, give and take. However, I have that with a lot of people. I have communication with people all over the world, really, through the column that I write for a parade magazine, which is, its reach is vast. But I have this communication with so many different types of people. People who, are, who think emotionally, people who think rationally, people who are looking for advice, suggestions, inspiration, support. I hope I provide that, I think I do, to a lot of people, people with very little position and people with significant positions. And so this is a very rich intellectual life that I enjoy and I hope I'm doing some good with it. I do the best I can. Let me ask you about that. How did it start, the call? Oh. Parade was writing an article about me, and so when they did that, the editor, someone there, I think it was the editor, just had the idea, uh, well, let's ask, uh, let's ask Marilyn some classic questions of the, I don't know, how many inches can dance on the head of a pin variety. Uh, they see questions that have, that have per perplexed and confounded uh, scholars and philosophers for centuries. We're going to ask you those questions, Meryl. And I said, excuse me, but how, how much of an ego do you think I have that I'm going to be able to just spin off a paragraph and answer something that people have pondered since Socrates? No, I'm not going to be able to do that. But if, we, if the readers would like to ask some questions, fine. Let's do that. Let's just see what happens. And so it turns out they got a flood of questions. And they were pl very pleased with that and said, well, maybe we could tiptoe into writing a column. And so I did, and that slowly turned into something. And so it, it, it turned into a column whereby now, as I said, through, through parades, parades, saturation of, uh, uh, of, the, of the people here in the United States, plus, as I said, seeding this throughout the world, I hear from people everywhere about all kinds of things. So it's great fun for me. You mentioned there are problems that need to be solved. So let me, let me pose this question to you, and I want to get your thoughts on it. Let's say uh, you weren't born when you were born three or four years ago. Do you think that a, a, a smart girl growing up today has, because you talked about how much wasn't expected of you is because is, you were a girl, you know, growing up. Do you think that dynamic has changed or, or does there still need to be more of an evolution? Are smart girls now treated differently than smart girls when you were a little girl, do you think? Oh, absolutely. They're treated, they're treated better. Uh, but women, the women, now you mentioned being born three or four years ago, so that's, that's a you don't know what's going to be happening in but, 25 years. But is there years. A, a difference still between, are smart men or smart boys still perhaps on a pedestal above girls, or is there more of a parity now, would you say? Mm, I think they're still on a pedestal, and I can understand that in some ways. Uh, but you don't agree with it. Who would, right? Well, one of the bad things is that women are their own worst enemy in some ways. In other words, uh, when women play up sex appeal, which they virtually all do, uh, it's terribly damaging to them. Now, in certain fields, fine, of course, entertainment, um, if one's going to be a singer, a model, an actress, there are lots of places where sex appeal, in other words, attractiveness is part of the package. That's fine. They do that and, and the men do that too. But 
in, in business, in, let's say, politics, and lots of other areas, when the women are attempting to wear a great deal of makeup, there's the hairstyle, and we all know what, you know, what, what that means. When it's, when it's done in a way to look physically appealing, it makes them look lightweight. And a huge number of women are doing that. And until they cut that out, they're not going to have parity with men who are sitting there looking the way you do. You know, you look like your real self. Uh, presumably, well, yeah, I realize but I have zero that. sex appeal. That's the <laughs> well, of course, the men on the air are wearing a little bit of makeup, too. But the point is just to smooth it out and, and look natural. Uh, but the women are doing that. They're, they're appealing. You know, they're attempting to look physically attractive. Let me ask you one final question because we've got to go. But uh, I tend to every once in a while lose my keys. And then I walk around the house saying, I'm such an idiot. You know, where did I put those? Have you ever once uttered those words? Because obviously, in your case, it would be a lie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I do that all the time. Perfectly normal. Nobody should worry about it. But I realize that as soon as you're something like 50 years old, the first time you lose your keys afterward, you think, Oh my gosh, I'm going downhill. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Just get as much mental exercise as you get physical exercise. Oh wait, maybe a whole lot more than that and everything will be fine. Marilyn, what a delight. Thanks so much for coming in. Really appreciate it. Thank you. That's it for this week. Join the conversation with us on social media. We are CCTV America on Twitter, Facebook and YouTube. And now you can watch Full Frame on our mobile app, available worldwide on any smartphone for free. Get the latest news headlines and connect to us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Weibo. Search CCTV America on your app store to download today. All of our interviews can still also be found online at cctv-america.com. And let us know what you'd like us to take full frame next. Simply email us at fullframe at cctv-america.com. Until then, I'm Mike Walter in New York City. We'll see you next time.